Hello everyone. Hello. Um, welcome to the session. Um, this is going to be a recorded event and, uh, and also we are using the iFlex environment. This is to say we have other students that are viewing this program right from home and they have the same feel like you being here physically looking at the instructor and they can ask questions from there and you all can hear them directly we have the speakers here and as you ask questions too they can hear you from home so in that backdrop what we want we need a perfect decorum so that those that are back home will be able to enjoy the session without any interruption so please pay attention and make sure you cooperate with the professor as I said earlier on, it's gonna be a recorded session. We're gonna record it, and um, we don't want to have like a background noise on it. We want it to be clear as best as possible. Thank you all for coming. Um, if any of you have not signed in yet, you can go right there um, at the front desk and try to sign in, and make sure you sign in, because the professor is gonna take record of all those um, that have signed in, and we're gonna take record of those that are also attending online uh, from home. So thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, like I mentioned, my name is Stephen McGowan. I'm going to be going over Wireshark tips and tricks um, for this presentation. Um, most of the presentation is going to be hands-on. So I only have a, a few PowerPoint slides. So I'll be switching back between the two. But the main thing is to be able to visually see all of these different tips and tricks. So let's go ahead and get started. All right. So this is our overall agenda. We're going to be looking at six different things. How do we go and distinguish different packets within Wireshark by utilizing the cup? We're also going to be able to go in and try to get rid of a lot of those different like IP addresses, port numbers, by implementing name resolution to be able to get Wireshark to do the work for you so you don't have to do so much guesswork. So we'll look at managing the columns that we have within Wireshark. We'll look at configuration profiles. We'll look at configuring this from the command line to quickly start capturing packets, particularly in emergency. And then we'll look at the immediate piece as well as the overall capture from the command line. So we're good there? Okay. All right. So before I get into the six objectives, I first want to make sure everyone here knows what Wireshark is. Wireshark is an open source product that allows you to analyze packets. In other words, it's a network scanner. And I know a lot of you have been through a lot of the classes and you have Wireshark exercises. So you've been through that particular piece. So we're going to monitor and inspect some of this data as we go through. This will work in a wired network or a wireless network. We have both of them. And we can pretty much run it in any type of operating system that's out there including Windows, Linux, and the Macintosh world. Is that looking good? All right, so let's dig in here. Uh-oh, somehow stop it. One second, folks. Any questions? Mm -hmm. There we go, so we were able to advance, we were good up. All right, while they're going over the technology stuff, let's look at the very first one. What we can do is use Wireshark to our advantage. Typically, when you go into Wireshark, what you just simply see is a bunch of individual packets. You don't actually see this color. And I'm going to show you how to turn these colors on and off within the, the Wireshark. So we'll be able to go in and come up with our own schemes. So if I have a cyber attack and I need to be able to go and analyze it, I can analyze just those individual packets and we can do it by an overall color scheme. What we've learned in Wireshark in the past is that we can capture packets when we first start it up called a capture filter. And then once we capture the packets, we can use a display filter. Now we're going to add one more level to where we can do filtering by color. And by doing it by color, it gives us a variety of enhanced visibility that you're gonna see as I go through and demo this stuff. We can color by preference. We can provide consistency. So I can set these color options up and I can have multiple people that are doing the analysis 
follow the same colorization so they can follow the analysis. So a lot of consistency there. We can also provide faster methods for analyzing the packet. We concentrate on the part that we want to actually go and analyze. And so I'm going to basically go through now and I'm going to show you um, the three different options within colorization. So we good over here, sir? Yeah. All right. So like I said, I'm going to demo most of the stuff that we're doing. So I'm going to move this slide over here. What we see when we first load up Wireshark, the first thing we have to do is select which interface that I'm actually going to go in and analyze. So if I go and I look at this, you see I have two different interfaces that are currently running. So if I go and select one of these, it will come up and it will start to capture packets assuming that I pick the correct interface. If I select the wrong interface, right, which this is the wrong one, I can go back up to capture, I gotta first stop it, and then go up to capture and go to options, and then I'll be able to go in and pick the, the correct interface. I'm not sure why it's telling it to me. Wireshark starts to capture the individual packet. We are seeing some color, so I'm going to show you how to go in and manipulate that. So to go in and look at the different color options, you go up to this view option that we have up here. And then you will see down here, you have three options. Colorized packet list, that allows you to turn it on and off. Coloring rules and coloring conversations. I'm going to spend most of my time in this particular option here called coloring rules. So I will bring this up, and then you will see here, these are a set of rules. They almost work like access control lists if you work with them. It goes by the order. So the ones at the top, as soon as it finds a match on the filter, that is the color scheme that it's gonna actually apply as it goes through. So right now we're seeing a bunch of different options, like if it's a bad packet, you know, it shows up in black. You'll see that you can have a background color as well as a foreground color. So I can go in, so like if I go and select this particular option here, I can immediately come down here and I can change the background color as well as the foreground color and change it. So if I come over here and I select this, and I go and pick red, for example, I can select okay, and then I'll be able to go and change the color. Professor, the screen on the zoom in is not showing, but you're showing the powerful video. Thank you. back in. So I go back up to view. These are my three different options for colorization. So I'm going to go to the coloring rules again, which was I was at. And you notice here it saved the color change. So I changed the background to be red. All right. So you can put in anything that you want. You can create your own. Um, if I want to go and create a new color for something, I would just hit the little plus symbol there. And then I have a new coloring rule. I can call it whatever I want. This option over here is what your basic display filter <coughs> actually is. Yes, sir. We don't see what you're doing. I'm sorry. This is easier now. All right, sorry about that. Let me move this up. All right. So you see here it's a red color. So what you can do is if I go in and you'll see the store the the new, I'll just do it again. So if I come in here and I hit the plus symbol, actually it's in there. But all 
right. So up here, you can start <coughs> typing in the filter. So if I go and type IP, actual display filter. If you look in this field up here in the green where I'll say hsrp.state not equal to, that is the display filter. So when you used Wireshark before, anytime you went and you said I want to limit what I'm actually seeing on the screen, it's the same syntax rules. And you're going to assign it a color which is going to make it easier to find. So I can go down here and change any of them. Like here if I go to a web page, that's going to be the hypertext transfer protocol. Port 80, I can go in and change this background color as well. So if I go out here, select that color, click OK, and then I click OK here, any HTTP traffic that would be generated would show up here in the appropriate color. So you can go in and you can change any of these things. So if I go, so if I go back in, all right, so I go to view. Go back, I look at the coloring rules. So all of this information has to be stored in a file, which is going to be stored in a file called color filters. So if I click on this particular link here, it will bring up a file, open up in a notepad, all right? And then you will see here, it has all of the different rules that are associated with it. Now all of these numeric codes here are what's called red, green, and blue codes. Those indicate what the colors are going to be for those individual rules. So you can set up all the rules you want. I'm not sure if there's any limitation that you basically have within Wireshark, but you have that capability. This information is stored. Because what you can do with this information, once you get this configured the way that you want, I can go and say hit the export button, and then I can go and save it. I'll just call it my colors, just for lack of originality and hit save, and it will save those settings. Then I can actually go and give that file to someone else that's running Wireshark, and they can bring in my color scheme by simply going in and hitting the import button. And then you see here, it's a file called my colors. I can select that and hit open, and then whatever rules were established can now be applied to the workstation we're currently working on. That's really good if you're working on a team, let's say you're doing a cyber investigation and you want to make sure the way that they're filtering, everyone is seeing the same information the same ways, we can set up the appropriate color scheme that we have available too. So we can go in and change any of these individual rules. All right? If I don't want a rule to be applied, I can go and I can uncheck it. So just because you created it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to use it. So we have a variety of options that we can do within the screen. Right? So color is everything. So when you see millions of packets going across the screen, particularly if you didn't do an initial capture filter and you don't really want to learn all the syntax of the display filter, this can be set up in advance. And then someone can just physically view it by the color itself. All right, any questions on this particular screen? Now, You'll see here, if I click OK, these colors are applied. You'll see there's some different colors. We don't really have a lot of um, traffic going on there. But if I go back up, and let's look at my utility here, go to View, and I come down and say Colorize Packet, I just turn it off. So now I go back to the standard, this white block text here. If I want to put the color back on for what I'm currently using, I go back up to View here, I look at my colorization, I select that, and then the color comes back. So it's very easy to turn it on and off depending upon whether you would like the colors or not. All right, another option that you can do in here with the colorization is this one down here, colorize conversation. So I can actually go over there and say, I'm watching this one individual PC and all the traffic that is going on, I can pick a color and every single packet relating to that conversation will show up in that color. So you can actually go pick a packet and then you can hit one of these control functions and it will actually go in and change the color for anything relating to that 
individual transactions. So you have that option to be able to do that as well. You can create new coloring rules if you want. You can also reset the color. So if I want to create a new role, you click that on, and it just takes you back up here. And you see this one, it basically duplicated the role, and it says, oh, the packet that you're looking at right now, this is what the display filter would actually read. So then I can say, go ahead and monitor that and set it to whatever color, click OK, and then as you see here, it's highlighting just the individual packets relating to that individual conversation. So you can do it within a display filter as well, but the color is just basically adding on to what the display filter feature actually gives you. So those are the three different um, colorization um, options that you have available to you. I do have some additional information if you want to where the information is physically stored in the folder and so on. I'll be more glad to talk to you after the presentation. So the next piece that we're gonna look at if I come back over to the PowerPoint slides, um, move over, it's all those, right, is network mean resolution. So if I go back into my Wireshark, I'm gonna show you a way to have Wireshark work for you, do not work for it, by converting numbers into names that hopefully you and I can actually understand. So once again, I like to demo everything. So if I come back over here, you see we kind of have a taskbar up here with a, a variety of different options that we have available to us. So I'm going to come over here, I'm going to go to view, and then you'll see I have a variety of options. You can get the main resolution here, but I'm going to show you a different way of um, actually getting in. So I'm going to go back over to edit, I'm going to go down to preferences, and then I'm going to select this option called name resolution and the two that I want to concentrate on are the two closer to the top where we resolve transport names and we resolve network IP address in information so we're going to look at that but first before I go in and manipulate those settings I want to come back and um, look at the main wire chart if you look here I want to show you two different things over here you're seeing information that's all numbers port numbers and so on. You've heard of well-known port numbers before, right? Because there's a name that's assigned to each one of those port numbers. I'm gonna get Wireshark to tell me those names. The other thing I'm gonna tell Wireshark to do is, I don't know who all these IP addresses are. Neither do you. So I'm gonna see if the system can help me identify who those packets are from by using some domain name services or simply DNS. So watch as I do each one of these individual Tasks. So if I go back over here, I can go to preferences. Now the first one that I'm going to select, this is right, you know, right? And sort of the name resolution, is this one called Resolve Transport Names. So I'm going to enable that. Then I'm going to click OK and I want you to notice what's going to change on my screen. I'll give it a moment. Alright, and what you will see over here, sorry. It should know. Let me go back and make sure it's enabled. All right. So what's going to do? Might might not have the table loaded, but what's going to do? It's going to go and convert these. For example, what is port number four four three? Can you remember? HTTPS, it will convert those numbers into an actual name. So I'll refresh this in a moment to get that piece to go. So let's go to the other one at the same time. If I come back over here, whoops, edit, go to preferences, there's multiple ways to get to the same resolution. I'm going to turn on resolve network IP address and click OK. happen and I have to um, test it to see what's going on with this configuration is these names here whatever is identified within DNS would replace the actual name now there are options of what you can do under statistics up here is you can actually go in and this is actually um, 
pretty cool and we'll be able to, to look at it. Let's see if we get to look at it. I have a newer version on my laptop down here. Um, so let me exit back out of the phone. I want to find out why this is. I have to come back and look at why that's not uh, being picked up on this machine. So in essence, what happens is Wireshark maintains multiple tables. For example, I know a lot of you have gone through some of the classes you learned about uh, MAC address, which is a hardware address. Who remembers what the first three bytes are used for? You don't remember? The manufacturer ID, then the last three parts are unique. There is an option under the name resolution checkbox to automatically enable that. That where you see the actual manufacturer um, ID. So if I went back, for example, preferences, and you will see here. So you see you have a variety of options under name resolution. So you can resolve the, the MAC address that's in there by default. That way you know, oh, this card is an Intel card, this is a Juniper card, whatever card. It tells you that information. So I can find from afar what type of hardware that you have, and Wireshark will tell me that, because it has tables internal to it that will do that. And I'll have to go back and see why I know the name resolution at this moment. Um, it's being picked up, but I promise you it works. And I did it earlier um, for my laptop as well, but we'll come back to that. So that's how we go in and enable it. So just make sure in this, options here that you check on what you want to resolve and it will convert it from an American number to a name that it actually understands. Okay. It could be just this particular implementation of it. If you want to see it later, I can show you too from my individual um, laptop. Now there are some concerns sometimes with the name resolution. Um, for example, when you load up Wireshark for the first time, it caches all of the DNS information. What I mean by that is, as it is capturing, any new name resolution that comes about, it will not recognize it, all right? But if you basically save it and then reload it, whatever the current name resolution that is out there, it will recognize it. So you can do something called a reload, and it will load that information um, back into the system itself, right? So we have those options in there as well. Let me just make sure I'm not missing anything. Just show you. Um, you can also go over here. Let's see if it's not um, doing the name resolution stuff. Let me get this over here for now. And this is going to close out of this screen. And if I go over here to statistics, you can look at something called resolve addresses. So you have an option here as well take it a moment and you see here it shows you the hardware addresses as well as IP addresses and the names that are associated with it. So I can actually, let's say all my DNS resolution is in there but not all of my numbers have been converted. I can manually go in and I can convert something and it will show up in, in this particular list. So I can actually come over here and basically set it up to where whoever this IP address is, I can give it a name. So if DNS didn't get it, I can manually override Wireshark, at least temporarily, to tell me what the name is that's associated with an individual IP address. So we have that um, particular option to be able to do with the name resolution. Very cool items for things that we can actually do. All right, let's look at the next one. The next thing I want to look at is you see here in Wireshark, we have a variety of columns. So we're going to look at how we can manipulate these columns. We can change the order, we can add columns, we can remove columns. We have a variety of options that we can go ahead and do. So for example, there's multiple ways of doing this. I'm going to show you just from this screen. If I right click on any of these over here, it gives me a listing of all the standard columns that I have. Check mark indicates that these columns are enabled. In other words, you're viewing that information. 
but if for some reason I didn't want to see, you know, the number, the packet number that's coming through, I can hit that check mark, and you see there the packet number is no longer showing up as a column on the leftmost side. So you can add columns, you can remove columns, you can temporarily not display a column. There's a variety of options that you can do. So like if I go back in, you'll see here, it's still there. If I click on it, I can bring it back to life. So you can go in and manipulate columns in this, in this manner. You can also go up here and you can look at you know, column preferences. It's another way of looking at it. So on this particular screen here, I can go in and say these are my columns. I can also go in and I can adjust the colors. Obviously I must be in the color because everything I'm looking at so far relates to color. But you can go in and you can manipulate it to whatever font and color that you so choose. That's completely up to you. It's your option to be able to do that. I can also go in and control the layout. This one is really cool. A lot of people don't know about this. But if I go back and I look at my standard Wireshark screen here, you see these are all my packets coming up, right? These are all of the different headers related to each packet. Over here is my hexadecimal information for this information, then it tries to convert it to something English that you and I can read. If I want to manipulate that, I can certainly do that by just going back in there and I can look at um, column preferences, all right? So I can look at the layout, and then up here you see the different options. So I could go and select this one, click OK, and now as you see it changed the screen. Right? So you might be more interested in this data, or you might want to look at the actual packet breakdown, or maybe you love looking at you know, hexadecimal. One of the things I like to tell my students, like this is the easiest way to learn the OSI model and what relates to each layer. Now you see here, I don't know why it's not showing up on the other screen. See how it converted the, the manufacturer of it? I don't know why it's not on the other screen, but look at it. IP version 4, 0800. If you go and you select something like that, it doesn't matter what panel it's in, you'll see it shows down in the hexadecimal, 0800. I remember many, many moons ago when I used to do this for a living, and I had to take a certification test. They would give you a dump like this. And you had to know every single field within a frame to know where the frame began. And then they would ask you questions like, what's the hardware address? What's the IP address? You know, what is it actually doing? So you have to read this hexadecimal dump. You didn't have Wireshark, you were the Wireshark. Right? It was your brain that was going in knowing all the different protocols, the frames, all that. So you can display whatever field that you want. You can make each window smaller, you can make it, you know, larger, all depends on what you're doing. So if I'm really trying to learn, you know, what the hexadecimal value is, so like if I look at this destination hardware address, you see that's the hexadecimal equivalent to it. Same thing with IP information, it shows up there as well. All right? So we can break that down. So you can go and, and you can look at any of the preferences that you want for any of these fields and lay them out the way they want. It basically comes down to personal preference. You know, so we can do any of that type of stuff. All right. So if we go back and look at the layout, I can switch it to be something you know, different. Again, I click OK. And as you can see here, you can specify what details go in what paint. So you're not even necessarily limited to what you see there. So I click OK. And it's kind of here. Now I have my packets, and then over here I break the packet down by each individual head. I'm telling you, the easiest way to learn the OSI model is to use Wireshark. So like if I'm teaching Network Plus or something like that, I always use Wireshark because when they talk about a header, header plus one, header minus one, you can actually walk through this and see how the different headers communicate with each other. Nothing is done within a vacuum. Everything has to tell the other one which to use. So for, for example, right now this says user datagram protocol for this packet. What's the difference between the user datagram protocol and the transmission control protocol? Anyone know? Connection, oh, connection. Which one tries to guarantee delivery? TCP. TCP. 
All right, so it's a little bit slower than UDP because UDP doesn't have the extra overhead. So if I was doing, you know, like a trivial file transfer protocol, it's going to use UDP, and you'd have to link all that stuff together. And Wireshark shows you all of that um, different information that is out there. So if I go back into these headers here again, you can edit a column. You'll see up here it tells you you can put the title, you can put the you know the type, you have a little drop down, well beyond the scope for today's presentation. So you can go in and you can manipulate what you want to be in any column. So you don't have to just go with what Wireshark gives you right out of the box is my point. You can add fields, you can delete fields, configure fields, do whatever in the world you want to do. Alright. So that's how we basically go in and add and remove. Alright. The next thing that we're going to, to look at um, under the edit option here is one down here, just being aware of our timing, um, is something called configuration profiles. It's sort of like using Windows. You have a profile notion that captures all of your different settings, your colors, all that kind of good stuff. Wireshark has the same thing. And by default, when Wireshark loads up, it loads up the default profile. We can change these profiles, we can add profiles, we can do a variety of different things. They even show you on this screen a little URL link down here to a folder. All right, in, in this particular one here, let's see if it comes up. But you can actually go out to this spot here. I'll show you later because we have to go out to the Wireshark later for an exercise and I'll show you where this actually is. But all of this information is actually stored. So you have that particular option in here. If I want to create a new profile, let's say I want to do one where I'm going to monitor DNS, I can come here and hit the plus symbol, hit DNS there, um, and then click OK. All right, click OK again, and then it comes up. Now I'm going to move the screen up here for a moment because um, I want you to see in the bottom right hand corner, this is my new profile. So anything that I change in here is gonna store it as part of the DNS. So maybe my goal today is just simply to look at DNS traffic. So I might go and change the order of my column or the information that I want, and it's all stored here. Anytime you wanna switch, you don't have to go through edit, you just come down here, click on this, and it shows you all the different options that you have available. So if I don't want the DNS anymore and I want to go back to, you know, the default, I just select default, it changes the display and it shows you what profile that you're currently in. So you can create profiles, you can go in and delete profiles, there's a variety of different options that you can go in to do. Alright, you can see here that you can import them and you can export them. You'll see here, and this is a little bit different than some of the, like, the colorization stuff, is that it can pull it from a zip file or it can pull it from a directory. So once again, you might, in, you know, in headquarters decide, well, this is what everyone's going to use as their profile. So you make it, you ship it to everyone, and they simply just do it. Import it in. You would export it out, they'll import it in. Right, so you have those options of what you can do within um, Wireshark. As you can even see here, these are some of the different ones that are out there. You see the profiles folder. You see there's one called DNS. That's the one I just created, right? And then you can save any types of changes. Now there's local and there's global. There's a variety of different options. We don't, we don't have time to look at all of those, but that's where the information is actually um, stored. Actually, I gotta show Everything you do pretty much in Wireshark configuration is stored somewhere. 
you decide how you want to use it. You don't have to use it the way it comes right out of the box, basically, when you download it from the internet. So you have a variety of different options that are available to you. Okay. Right. If you go out and look in the Wireshark folder, um, you'll see some of this configuration information as well. All right, let's continue on and look at some other things to make sure we have time for question and answers and I don't overstep my time. All right, so how many of you heard of something called TCP dump? Anyone heard of that? What is TCP dump used for? Mm -hmm. Anyone remember? Capturing packets at the command line? What a lot of people don't know is Wireshark actually gives you their own new program called T-Shark. And I'm going to show you basically how that works. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out to my command prompt. So I'm going to type in TMD. I'm sure you can still see it on the screen. So I'm going to CD backslash. I'm going to go to the program files. The only reason why I'm doing this manually is because Wireshark's not in my, my path. So I'm going to go into Wireshark and press return. And if I do a DIR slash T, pause the screen one page at a time, uh, you will see that we have a utility down here. One second. All right, T Sharp. It's called T Sharp.exe. So this is the command line that will allow you to go and capture packets without going into the GUI version of Wireshark itself. But there's a trick to this. You have to know what the interface number is that you're going to use because you have to specify it with the dash i parameter when you go to use it. So I'm going to show you a quick way of doing it, which is actually easier to understand than going through the GUI part. So if I go and type in t sharp like this, space dash d, like this, it comes up and tells me on this computer I have two interfaces. But here's what's cool about this version of doing it. You will notice on this one, it actually gives you the interface number. The other ones, like if you go to capture option, you can see all the interfaces, but it doesn't tell you the number. You kind of have to count. The other thing I noticed, like on my laptop, you know, I got virtualization, I got multiple network cards, all kinds of stuff. When Wireshark first comes up, the interfaces are set, and then it changes them. It's kind of weird. So if you don't get the right number, like trial and error, you'll specify the wrong interface. This always tells you true of which interface that we want to look at, one or two. So let's try. So if I type in T-sharp, just like this, and I do dash I, then you have to specify whatever interface that you want to look at. So what I will do is I will just go, and I will just say one. Don't know which one, but I'll know here in one second. I press return. And it's not really finding anything. Okay? So I'm going to hit Control C. Now I'm going to do the same command again, but I'm going to do a 2. What's it doing? It's capturing the packets, but it's doing that the command line. Now, this is just displaying it on the screen. Can you read all that? Do you memorize every little packet going by? There's no way in the world that you're going to be able to do that. So, what I'm going to do is hit Control C to get out of it. And then I'm going to go back, and I just hit the up arrow. That's how I get to the previous command. And I'm going to use the dash w option. So I'm going to do dash w space, right? And then I'm just going to call it my capture, just for lack of originality. All right? So I press return. Now I don't see all the packets. Where did they go? They went into this file called what? My Couch. What's nice about dumping it to a file, because then I can use like find, grep, all of those commands to search through this information. I can't do it when scrolling across the screen like that. There's no way. So, well, let's say you do want to go back to the old display. Here's what you would do. I hit Control C. If I do a DIR, my star dot star, which shows me everything, starts with NY. It comes up and there's my caption. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to type T sharp. All right. 
and then I can go and use something called dash r, and then I'm going to specify the file for my gotcha. Let's see if it works. Now it's just fun. Sort of like the DOS type command, or the cat command in Linux, something like that. It just simply displays the contents of the file. It's pretty cool. So you don't need GUI to be able to, to do this. All right? So, you know, I told you, this stuff works with Windows, it works with Unix, it works with Mac. There's a variety of different flavor options that you have. So this is a pretty cool utility, guys. Uh, when would you use T5 instead of using like a lot of times? A lot of times I would use it like in scripting. So if I had something else, I want to do this, do this, capture this, and then I could automatically do a find or like a grep to go get information and spit it out. So I don't need to be there. Or just capture it in the background. I don't want to monitor a screen. So it, it really depends. Everyone has a different people. I mean, like some of you might be Linux lovers. You like doing everything on the command line, <laughs> right? Some people don't like anything command line. They want to do it through a GUI-based environment. It really comes down to personal choice. Now, what I do recommend that you do, I only talked about a couple of the options with the T-Sharp. There, there's probably 30 options that are available with this particular utility, so there's more that you can actually do. You can use um, filters, just like we have capture filter and display filter. You can do that on the T-Sharp command line. So you can tell that I only want to see these packets. Why well, capture everything when I can just get to the information that I want? All right, but we could be here for days talking about all the different cool options that we have. All right, any questions relating to T-Sharp? All right, watching our time. I have a question for Professor Gowan. Yes. I I keep this word search pull up on my command prompt. You say you're not getting at your command prompt? Yeah, I type word search, open the admin right. privileges, and open the, the type in word search, and it doesn't run. All right, let me, let me show you something. I can tell you exactly the reason why. Earlier when I started this demo for T-Shark, you'll notice that I moved over to the program files backslash Wireshark. The reason why I did that is the Wireshark folder is not in your path command. So when you type the name of an executable, if it's not in that folder in your path, it won't find it. So if you switch over to this folder here, by doing the CD backslash, make sure program files is in quotes. You can tell me why. It needs to be in quotes. Space. Because it has a space in it, then backslash Wireshark. Then you can run Wireshark, and then you can also run T Sharp. So that would most likely be the reason why it's not running for you. The other yeah, best way, and that's what the last topic's going to be, is creating a shortcut. But I'm going to show you something that you can do a little fancy with the shortcut itself. All right, any other questions out there? All right. How do you turn it off? Excuse me, I couldn't hear you. How do you get it to start capturing? All right, so if I go back to my previous commands, all right. So if you want to write it to a file, you say T sharp space dash I, I stands for interface. Um, then the interface number, you have to make sure you know which interface that you want to review. If you want to dump it to the screen, you just press return. If you want to dump it to a file, you use the dash W and give it a name. And it will write okay. it to a file. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no problem here. All right. So a lot of different options here with this utility. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and make sure I'm out. All right, so I'm back into my GUI base we have here. So I'm for this last part, I actually don't need uh, Wireshark right off of the bat. I go in. I'm just going to uh, minimize this stuff. Um, I just want to make sure. Now, here's an existing shortcut. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a copy of this shortcut. So I'm going to say copy, and then I'm going to dump another one over here, and I'm going to paste it. So this one says Wireshark copy. Well, I'm going to rename this particular one, and I'm going to call it Wireshark now. Call it whatever you want. I'm just calling it. You'll see why in a moment why I call it Wireshark now. So, so I rename that shortcut. It's not going to do anything different by renaming it. If I double click on it, it's going to run, right? No different. Well, watch what I'm going to do next. I'm going to go in and I'm going to manipulate the property 
relating to this, and you see this is the name of the executable. For the person that was on the line, this is what I was saying you had to do. You had to go to this folder, and then execute what? Wireshark. Now let's say you got a crisis going on at work. Someone's doing something they shouldn't be doing, and you want to get those packets immediately. You don't want to miss a single packet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell Wireshark, I want you to load immediately and start capturing packets. I don't want you to wait for me to click here, click there, click there. I want it to be done right off the bat. Well, we already learned with the t sharp command, if I want to start capturing packets on a particular interface, what option do I use? Do you remember? The I option. I for interface. All right, and then I got to specify a number. I'm going to use interface number two. All right, so that's going to say load up Wireshark, and I want you to look at interface two. But I'm not done yet. I have to do a space, and then I'm going to do a K. All right, K means I want you to run. I want you to load Wireshark and immediately start doing what? Capturing packets. So what I'm going to do here now is I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to click or just fly. Okay, same thing. And then when I go and I double click on it, this one's called Wireshark now, right? So if I double click on it, let's see if it makes a liar out of me. Boom, it's automatically running and it's capturing my packets. Pretty cool. Now there's other options with Wireshark you can go out and look at. So I can go in and specify the filter of what I'm actually want to look at. Well beyond the scope here for the time that we have today, but I have those options to be able to go in. Alright, any questions so far? Alright, let me go back to you. Alright, so the things that we looked at were distinguishing packets using packet colorization, name resolution, and a few issues there, we'll look at that when we're done here, changing your Wireshark column layout. Alright, so we have that configuration profiles packets from the command line, that's our t sharp and then by modifying our little icon, the shortcut, to immediately have Wireshark start capturing packets. All right, any questions? Who wants to apply it to this? Is it because it's Monday? Brain has to start at work again. Any questions online? I'm good. You're good? All right, anything we need to do to wrap up? No, no questions? All right, if not, um, we do have a, question, a few questions in the chat. We can look at those and see what's going on. This is more about the screen detection and stuff like that. All right, so we're good then. Anything else? If not, I'm here. You can ask any questions you want. I'm going to bring up my laptop. I'll check the name resolution. I know that part works perfectly great, but it needs to go the time. All right, any questions? And I can show you how to do it from uh, Wi-Fi as well, if you so wish. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I thank you, thank you, thank you um, very much for coming today.